Well, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Julie Chavdi, the Associate Director of Health and Wellbeing Program with the Workwell Center and your host for today. In support of May Mental Health Awareness Month, we're excited to have you all here today for our last session of the Courage to Go Forward five-week webinar series sponsored by the USC Workwell Center's Healthy Campus Mental Health Subcommittee. The goal of the series is to raise awareness about mental health, reduce stigma, and provide support and community. So over the next 50 minutes, our speakers will be sharing their expertise around this very important topic, sharing support resources, and engaging you in conversation. Throughout today's session, you're welcome to ask questions, make comments in the chat or the Q&A function, and we will have a live Q&A at the very end, along with raffle prizes and an evaluation form for you all to fill out. So please remember to mute so that we don't hear any background noise, and we'll go ahead and get started. So last week, you heard about building connection, community, and a caring culture. And we have that recording on our Workwell website if you missed it and want to view the recording. Today, we'll hear from three expert speakers and discover practical strategies for promoting psychological safety and belonging in teams, strategies for finding the right therapist, and how to support students' mental health and well being, and ways to incorporate compassion and self care as we go forward and conclude this series. Now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cindy Ryan, Associate Director of Clinical Services with the Workwall Center, Jason Sackett, Therapist, Executive Coach, and Workplace Behavior Consultant in Private Practice, and Danielle Gott, Assistant Director for Outreach and Prevention Services, Licensed Clinical Social Worker and Clinical Instructor of the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Keck School of Medicine. So before we begin, I'd like to invite you to take a short stretch break with me. Feel free to stand, move, stretch in any manner that feels best for you. So feel free to reach your arms overhead and stretch, interlace your fingers and reach your arms to the sky. Lean to one side left side or right side and hold that stretch there and then take it to the other side stretching out our shoulders our back wiggle out your arms and fingers for all that typing we do and then let's take some shoulder rolls to the back making sure our posture is straight we're seated our abs are in our chest is lifted our shoulders are back and relax so thank you so much for participating in that short stretch break with me. And with that, I'll turn it over to Cindy to provide an overview of our Healthy Campus Mental Health Subcommittee, which she co-leads along with Dr. Chantelle Young with the School of Medicine. Cindy? Yeah, thank you, Julie. This is part of our initiative for uh, a healthy campus. So thank you to the Mental Health Committee and our goals of increasing awareness, knowledge and sensitivity toward mental health issues, that we want to educate the community about all the resources that we have on and off campus. This is really why we're sharing today, that we want to provide meaningful programming and encouraging departments, schools, teams to really look at how do they provide open communication and mental health support for all of staff to look at the barriers that impact our access to services, whether it's stigma, whether it's just dynamics of how we navigate systems, we wanna learn how do we make it seamless and effortless to reach out for help. And we wanna advocate for policies that will improve our, our quality of mental health services and create well being. Our committee is great and mighty, and we are so grateful that we have so many participating. It's just incredible to hear the ideas coming forth every month about what we can do and where we can make a difference. Our mental health awareness planning committee is listed as well and have been really good advisors and overseers. They'll help us debrief and we'll improve our programming as we go forward. And so, Next slide, Julie. This is for me. 
Yeah. Yes, thank you, Cindy. Um, we're really excited to hear about your uh, your brief talk on ways to promote psychological safety at work. So go ahead. Well, thank you. You know, uh, we had Toby, but she unfortunately was not feeling well. We want to bring her back because she does have an important message. But because we want to look at what do we do going forward? What is our future? What do we have to do to be thinking, you know, what do we need in our workplace for the future? And psychological safety is a key ingredient. So looking at the research I found in Forbes, that they conducted a survey of Fortune 500 companies and they interviewed their employees and they wanted to find out from them directly what was it that created a psychological safe environment. They came up with about 15 points that they wanted to create an environment where people feel welcome to share. And is that not it when we feel we're part of a team, we want to feel included, we want to feel part of something, we want to get in on that synergy of offering ideas and growing. So the first one was engaging with consideration and authenticity, where there's consideration for all ideas. There's not a a wrong idea. There's always something to learn and to receive from input and ideas that staff can bring. A second one was don't rush to fix things. We're a very high achieving environment. We have leaders who want to always be there on top of things. And it's very natural to want to fix whatever solution might be going forward for us. But they offered this wonderful thought about a tool of warm silence, a warm silence that allows others to think about the challenge and come up with their own conclusion and build on that capacity and build on that trust. So it's very much like stepping back and letting someone find the solutions it was very empowering. Third, lead with empathy, not ego. We're very strong achievers. And a lot of times we want to take hold of that messaging or we want to make sure we're getting our idea across. But if we look at it as being driven by what will be understanding someone else, understanding of how it would feel to receive feedback, or how do we want to make employees feel comfortable and safe when saying, hey, that's a good idea. And have you thought of this as well? So moving forward on this idea of feedback, you know, we have this in so many different arenas. We have it in our supervision and our performance reviews. We send out a feedback form when we do a presentation. We want to learn what our people are giving us in response to what we've shared. And so being open to it, looking at it as something that sets us forward. This idea was really good about communicating that simplifies and clarifies a clear vision of the goals. That's a trust that we have a shared direction. It may not need a lot of explanation. It may just need clarity and simplicity. We need to do this for our team, our staff, our, our environment, our department. Building on the trust, the trust of feedback that shares and listens and really just takes it in. Again, a little bit of that stepping back and just receiving information. And really, at the same time, as leaders, especially when we're clarifying direction or we're implementing new thoughts or changes, really making it known that we are sharing the circumstances. Sometimes we have to be very open about this is the organizational circumstance. This is the current politics. This is the current event. This is why we may need to do this. This can be a way of building trust and faith in leadership. The other one was approach things with curious perspective. And we look at this and Jason is an, just an incredible expert in executive coaching. And oftentimes with leadership, we might encourage them to approach issues or concerns with appreciative inquiry, like a question, help me understand. I wanna learn more about your perspective. You know, Share with me how you got to that thinking. And that way you build on that support and collaboration. For the next slide, you'll see, we're looking at building on a culture of team, not just talent, because the reality is everyone has talents. 
everyone has something very important and unique that they're bringing to the table. That's their A-team approach, that we all have something we want to receive and appreciate in building our culture of a team. We build a culture where mistakes are okay, where we learn from them, that we understand them, Sometimes, you know, the old saying, happy accidents, sometimes things happen and it, it helps us kind of see something we might not have seen before. And it gives us a chance to really learn and help each other, give ideas, share point of view. Um, classic in all of our leadership skills, we talk about active listening. And I look at this as the meaning here is receive all ideas with yes, thank you versus a tone that might belittle or judge. We say, no, that's not a good idea. You know, and we head it down a path or we're dismissing something that could be a potentially very incredible path of innovation or new thinking. So see where this can bring you forward. Build that sense of belonging where all feel welcome, that we're building relationship. We share more about who we are, what do we do behind the scenes every day at work? How do we see each other as, you know, important to whatever we're doing? And understand, this is a crucial piece here, um, that we need to foster certainty and growth in the opportunity that we have what we need to work and personal life. That may mean resources for our work. That may mean time. That may mean how we flex for a balance of work-life balance within family needs and work needs. So fostering that sense of certainty, like, yes, we can take care of that. We can do that. And then support our coworkers helping each other. I've heard many times in team meetings where people say, yeah, I'm. thank you so much. You chipped in, you helped me out so much. But that meant someone else had to put their work a little bit aside. And knowing that there's grace and permission for saying, yes, let's help each other and we'll flex and we'll make our work get done as we help each other. Going forward again, let's continue promoting openness. I think, you know, we understand that, you know, an open mindset is part of that, being able to share what we're doing. And I've heard through different team meetings, that idea of, what do we need as a team? How do we want to consider professional development? What do we want to build into our growth uh, personally and professionally? So then we value each other as humans. We recognize that we're members of a human nature, uh, a work experience, a culture, a community at USC that we really need to build ultimate respect for inclusion and collaboration and compassion. So as leaders, create your rules of engagement. Think about what you want to build as your identity, your norm. What's your communication plan? What's your conduct? How do you build consideration for all with gratitude like th and thanks? So how do we build back when we set these goals? How does it play out in our day-to-day -day approach? So thinking forward on that, We've got staying present, focus on what you can do, credit all that is given, enlist partners to help achieve a goal. This has been an incredible team experience here in these series we've made, and we want to make it better each time. We consider the blameless apology. We're all in it together. If something happens, it happens, but we grow through it and we rise through it as well. Notice our care for emotional needs, offer help if important, especially when we're looking at how do we diffuse that awareness of mental health support. We may need to know that we're that kind voice that says, you know, if you need something, I'm here for you. One of the great thoughts for the day I came across was something we can always remember, all gifts, no matter how humble, are ever lost. So I want to bring that forward and make it our mission in the future to say we're committing to this way of life and this way of thinking to make our world feel safe in every way. So Julie, back to you. Thank you so much, Cindy. Such great tips for 
all of us to keep in mind, not only at work, but in our personal lives too. So thank you for, for that great presentation, Cindy. I know you'll be back later today, but for now we'll move forward. And I would like to introduce Jason Sackett. Jason, turning it over to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. Um, thank you for uh, for inviting me to share my thoughts at this webinar. Um, I'm I'm uh, I'm flattered to to be asked to do so. Uh, I'm Jason Sackett. I in in private practice. I used to be at USC in the USC Work Wealth Center before it was called that. I was there for over 13 years. Um, <clears throat> I'm here today to talk to you about connecting to therapists. Um, it was interesting that uh, that. Cindy Ryan uh, referred to me as a uh, as an experienced coach. Um, mm -hmm. The reason I'm talking about connecting to therapists today is because I barely have time to be a coach anymore. Mm -hmm. um, when I was uh, when I was at USC, I would say my coaching was about 25 percent of my overall work. Now it's barely five percent, mm -hmm. um, and there's a reason for that, and it's called COVID. Um, we we all we all know it. We, we've, we've all heard about it for years. Um, and even though the, the coronavirus emergency uh, order is over, uh, the effects of, of COVID are going to be long lasting on our mental health, you know, collectively and individually. Um, I, I think that's, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that's a very controversial statement. Um, and I have, uh, I have a, a particular data point that makes me believe that. Uh, well, actually a couple of data points. Um, my, my wife is a high school counselor. And so I hear on a daily basis um, how, how mightily her students struggle um, compared to you know, pre-COVID. Um, but the, the data point I'm thinking about is, is my own schedule. Uh, in 2019, um, when, I, when I started private practice, I was determined to, to set up my schedule so that I would have every other Friday off. I have not had a Friday off in like two and a half years. Um, that's how busy I am, and that's how strong a demand there is for clinical services. Um, what I am, I guess you could call it a prediction. What I'm warning everyone now is that it is very likely that you or someone in your family or someone who works for you or someone close to you some, some way is going to need mental health services. They're going to need a therapist for one reason or another um, because mental health challenges are increasing. They're not slowing down. I'm not getting any less busy. Um, and, uh, and, and so this service has become in high demand. And the, if there's one thing I want you to take from this talk today, it's to be an informed consumer of, of therapy, of mental health services, and to organize, mobilize the services before you need them. Uh, let me say that one more time. Find the services, have them in place before you need them. Um, if you need them, if you already need them right now, sorry, I'm, I'm late in, uh, in, in giving you that warning. but. Um, but, and here's why, it can be frustratingly hard to, to find these services, to find the right service for you or for your loved one or, or for your coworker or subordinate or, or supervisor. It can be really hard. Um, this is part of my job. This has been part of my job for, you know, for most of my career is to help other people connect with services. Um, and I find it challenging. I know the business and I still find it challenging. So if it's hard for me, it's gonna be hard for just about everybody. So, so, so one thing to consider is that it's gonna take some legwork. Um, it, you, you, you don't always get lucky and find someone great who is funded and, and, uh, and available on the first try. Simply finding someone who is available can be a challenge depending on where you live and, and, and what, Type of service you need. Um, I, uh, I gave a talk at a school back in um, February. So these were, this was like a K through K through eight school. Um, my message to them was, um, 
if it's if it's children, you're probably going to need in-person services. Um, one nice thing about about uh, mental health services is that they've expanded um, dramatically, and the and the reach has expanded dramatically um, during the pandemic to include you know lots and lots of people providing services virtually, um, including myself. That's that's what I do exclusively. Um, and uh, I, I'm not going to say that it's as good as in person, but it's the next best thing, and it's uh, and it's and it's as good as you need for most people, but not for kids, and 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 for a lot of adolescents too. They, um, my experience was I just I, it just didn't work. I could not connect with them, um, the way that I could in person. So so they're probably so so if it's a child or adolescent involved, probably going to need in person services. For everyone else, if they if they can access a you know a virtual service, that makes it easier because then that opens up to you the entire state of California to find a provider. Um, which uh, which is nice to have that that much option. Um, here's a couple of things you're going to have to consider, though. Um, first one is cost. Um, it's not a it's not an inexpensive service. It's a you know if you if you pay for it out of pocket, it's a, it can be a prohibitively expensive service, especially if you work at USC. Sorry, I had to get that one in. Um, uh, I think uh, it's probably. Probably not that many people who work at USC can afford to pay for private therapy on a weekly basis um, at at a at a fair market rate. It's just that expensive, unless you unless you have saved for it, um, which some people do, or some people allocate like the majority of their budget to that because it's that important. Okay, I'm I'm good with that. Um, but if you don't have that luxury, then you're looking at a funding source. Who is going to be your funding source? Um, so that's gonna that's going to come to either insurance, uh, some kind of employee assistance program, either internal, external, and USC has both, um, or some kind of free or public resource. Um, I believe USC has one of those too, or at least they used to. I should have checked this before before I came on today. But uh, Department of Psychology has a they used to have a free clinic that was staffed by by students. Uh, it wasn't. I'm sorry. It wasn't free, but it was very low cost. Um, but you had to be every every session had to be. You had to consent to have every session videotaped or video recorded for for training purposes. But that's a really good benefit. That's uh that's that's the kind of resource that some people need if they don't have access to to good insurance or uh, or or good funding sources. Um, if uh you know if you work at USC and you don't opt out. In other words, if you're not like on a on a spouse's plan or or opt out of 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 insurance altogether, you have some kind of insurance coverage. Um, even the HMOs will have insurance um, coverage. I'll tell you right now, those are not great HMOs. Um, and so, so if you if you have one of those and it's not cutting it for you, you might have to look at one of those free or public resources. Uh, if you have the EPO or the PPO, that gives you access to Lira. That's an external employee assistance program that has a big network of providers, um, and uh, and and they they offer you 25 sessions per calendar year per family member um, of a of a nuclear family. That's uh, that's like benefits eligible partners and dependents. That's a really good benefit. Um, but the next thing besides funding is fit, right? Um, hate to say this, but not everybody is good. Um, in fact, somebody once told me, you, you, you don't have to take this at face value, but somebody once told me that uh, in any profession, only 15% of people are worth patronizing. Um, and I said, why is that? Said, because of a normal distribution. Um, you know, anyone below the top 15% is less than a B plus student. Do you really want less than a B plus student providing you, know, providing you with a service if you could have someone better than that? No, not really. You, you, want, you want the top 15. So statistically speaking, you're not going to, you know, you are not going to find that on the first try. You might have to cycle through some people, even if they are in the top 15. Um, they're not, they're not necessarily going to be the fit, the best fit for you. You know, I, I, uh, I arrogantly consider myself in the top 15, but I also humbly admit that I'm not the best fit for everybody. Um, so, uh, so again, the message is. Do the work early. Find find out what your funding sources are. 
be prepared to cycle through some people through trial and error. There is no shortcut to that, by the way. Even if you, like people would come to me when I worked at USC and they would say, can you, can you match me up with a good therapist? Well, I don't know if I can or not. Like I know a few people, I don't know what their availability is in real time. Um, I don't know if they have any spots open at the moment. And, and even if they do and they can get you in, I don't know how you're gonna fit with them necessarily, even though I know them and I know that overall they are good. You're still gonna have to check them out for yourself and make sure that they fit. Um, and that's just, that's just something that has to be done. And, and so you can be selective. If someone doesn't feel like a good fit, keep looking. You know, if you take your car to a mechanic and you have a bad experience, you don't keep going back to the same mechanic. You find another one on the very next try. Um, so, so this is uh, this is how you do it. Now, one one other thing I will mention about this is that um, some providers will talk to you on the phone. You can call them up, um, and and they might uh, you know they might answer some questions. You could ask them like, hey, what's what's your experience? What's your style? How do you work? Um, here's the issue that I'm coming in for. You know, how how would you address that? Um, that can that that might help with the selection process a little bit. It also might help you get a sense of of whether that person you know fits with you well. If you feel a connection to that person, if somebody won't talk to you over the phone, if they insist on making an appointment in person the first time, or if that conversation is like five minutes and they barely answer your questions, you might decide that that might not be the best person for you. That they're going to be very Kind of protective of their time and that's their first priority and and you're taking a chance that uh you're, you're basically burning a session taking a chance to see if you fit with that person so if you can if you can get people to talk on the phone or even to answer some questions over email that's legitimate people do that to me all the time um i once uh, I, I have a client who who actually not only talked to but but scheduled six in-person in-person sessions with uh, with six different providers before he chose one, he picked me. Um, but uh, but he was he was extremely selective. Um, you can be that selective uh, depending on what your needs are and, and how much time you have. But but again, there's one thing I that you take from this: it's do it ahead of time. Start looking now, even if there isn't an immediate need. Look into it. See what your resources are. You know, if you if you had an issue come up, who would you want to go to? Do the legwork now. You'd be very happy to have that in advance because when you know when you're in, when you're in the middle of a crisis and you're scrambling to find a resource, it makes it much much harder. And and I wouldn't want to see you in that situation. So mm -hmm. I think uh, I think I think I've said enough. Um, and I'll, I guess I'll, I guess maybe there will be questions at the end. Yeah, but there's a question that's really relevant to what you're saying, Jason, if you wouldn't mind answering it is, oh, sure. how can you tell when your therapist is not good? Any advice? <laughs> on that? Um, yeah, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, <clears throat> I recently uh, did a phone screening with someone who, who, who told me, she said, I don't think I know what good therapy looks like. And I, but I told her, I said, but it sounds like you know what bad therapy looks like. Um, and, uh, and so part of it is gut feel, right? Like if you just, if, if you, if you don't feel like you are being listened to, um, if you don't feel like you're being taken seriously, if you don't feel like you've been given sufficient time and attention, um, those are, those are big red flags. Um, <clears throat> now, yeah, I think, uh, yeah. To me, those are the those are the most straightforward ones. Do you do you feel listened to? Um, you know, does does the therapist ask you? You know, does it feel like I have thoroughly heard your concerns here? Am I missing anything? Um, you know, do they ask questions? Are they curious? You know, do they seem interested or do they seem, you know, disinterested or disengaged? Um, you know, are do they do they seem like they like their job, or does it seem like they're punching a clock? Again, not everyone is good. I've uh, I've I've heard of I've I've heard clients describe to me therapists who felt like they were punching a clock and would, couldn't wait for the session to end, um, and others who were like extremely engaged and and felt like it was the first time that they'd ever really been heard or seen. Um, that's the expectation that I would want you to go in with that that you are going to be 
thoroughly heard and seen because um, that's that's the minimum. Now, as far as like how much how how quickly do you make progress? Um, that's that one's a little more complicated because again, you could have an excellent therapist and get excellent therapy and not necessarily make progress quickly. Some some things just take time. Um, but I would also expect a therapist to be responsive to that too. I've had clients come to me and say, look, like we've been at this for a while and I really like you and we've had great conversations, but I, I don't feel like I'm making any progress on my issues. I don't feel like my anxiety, my depression, my whatever is getting any better. Um, and then how does the person respond to that? Do they say, well, let's just keep trying. Let's just, you know, eventually it'll happen. Or, or does the person like really get down to it and say, Okay, let's let's think about this. Let's think about what's possible here, and and let's also consider, you know, am, am I the best person to help at this point? Um, mm. and, and I personally never assume that. I never automatically assume that I'm the best person to help. Um, I I believe I can help most people with most things, but I don't assume I don't automatically assume that I'm the best person to help, uh, especially if someone's not making progress. I will I will. I'm, I'm I'm happily open to the possibility that somebody else might be able to 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 help the person make more progress where I have not. Great, thank you so much for sharing those great tips, Jason. Feel free to put more uh, questions in the chat if you like for for Jason to answer. But we'll move forward for now, so we can uh, have Danielle Gott uh, share what she is working on at USC around student mental health and well-being and how we as faculty and staff can support that work. So Danielle, welcome. Well, oh, thanks for having me. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I know as faculty and staff, we hear a lot about students. And, and yes, I have found it a way to even work in this for presentations through work well, but that is because our student well-being impacts our well-being as faculty and staff, right? We well-being in general, one way I like to conceptualize it is we're a collective, right? And depending on which department you're at at USC, you may officially be part of the well-being collective, but our students' experiences impact us. And as faculty and staff, you're the first responders, right? We know that students are going to present in that student affairs office or in their academic area or their residents fall long before they come into student health. And what we've found is we get a lot of questions, right? How do I provide support to these students, right? Or I'm feeling really, really anxious having this conversation with this particular student. And so one of the things we took a step back to look at is well, how can we provide faculty and staff support? You know, what are some of those things we're noticing and themes that are happening for our students on campus, right? And, and so we know just on the slide below, we have students who are experiencing the impact of isolation, right? Even though a lot of the pandemic uh, restrictions have changed, isolation and loneliness is still huge. A general increase in anxiety, right? And this increased need for services in general. So similar to how Jason mentioned his services for, in, for individual therapy increasing, we're seeing a real parallel process with our students. Um, and so we can go on to the next slide. Um, and so how do we engage students and faculty in well-being, right? And, and so we are going to do that by looking at, well, how do we provide the individuals that students turn to for support with support, right? Because there's an impact from that student coming to you in your classroom or in your uh, office if you're in student affairs and having the proper supports to guide you through those conversations is important to your own well-being. And so what we have worked to do um, is bring Cognito, a program uh, to campus uh, with the goal of increasing our awareness, right? What is mental health? What does it look like? What are symptoms? When do we need to refer someone to a higher level of care? When do we need to encourage someone to use a resource on campus other than counseling and mental health or, or student health services and really helping faculty feel supported in that process? And we can go to the next slide. So in order to help those students, we develop, or not develop, we started working with Cognito, which is a third party evidence-based program that is used at universities across the country and in other work settings to really help faculty, staff, and providers walk through real life scenarios um, to understand what is it like to have a challenging conversation? What is it like to sit with that awkwardness? 
um, things happen on campus. We have had, um, unfortunately, I sit on the postvention team for campus that deals with any kind of student loss, whether it's an accident um, related to illness or related to a mental health concern that manages uh, student death. And I share that because I see the impact that it has on faculty. And, and a lot of that starts with, well, what do I say when the student comes into my office? Do I cancel class, right? And we provide those formal supports that work well in CMH, but those individual conversations that may be occurring during office hours or other settings can be really, really challenging to navigate. And so the hope is that this program will help individuals feel more confident um, in that process. So we'll go to the next slide. And so this is similar to how the format is for Cognito. I think it's a great resource. I've gone through the self-guides myself. Um, and what will happen is Maya, the student, will come in, will present, and it will take you through a decision tree where you actually get to select, hey, here's the response I would give. And then it will take you to the next step. And then the avatar will give you feedback about your response, right? So. This is maybe why this is a better response than this response. Here are other ways that you can say this. Um, so it is a lot more innovative and intuitive um, to the real experience in the moment than just going through and taking a training that's like select A, B, C, or D. And I know we've all done that because we all have the same required trainings that USC um, has us do. And I, I can guarantee that this is much more engaging, but also really helpful with navigating those challenging questions for us as first responders and, and faculty members that are really responding to students in distress in a way that we weren't doing 10 years ago, right? Or even five years ago. And, and so campus well-being really becoming part of the collective um, and existing outside of counseling and mental health services is becoming more of the norm or is a new norm rather. And we wanna make sure folks feel supported in that. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So as I started mentioning a little bit about what the modules are like, it is an asynchronous virtual module. It goes through social emotional learning, mental health triage, which is something again that is happening a lot. And then how do you manage it after, All right? So this is really a, a great resource. Um, and it's, we have it, we've gotten through legal and all the red tape and things we need to bring this to campus. Um, it is not a mandatory training at all. So again, this is a resource for faculty and staff to use on their own. Um, it will be live this summer. We're working on rolling out the marketing material to make sure all faculty and staff are aware of this resource. But it really is supportive um, and takes a lot of that worry away, right? When you have a student who's coming to your office talking about grief and loss or talking about a challenge they may have related to a relationship or any of the various life issues that come up for students on campus. And so having really a role play before to engage in, right? To practice these things before you are in um, the actual moment is a tremendous support. And then go to the next slide. So again, just more about how it works. Again, I mentioned earlier that it is evidence-based. It's used across the country. It's helping to navigate um, the risk and the animated module is, is really good. Um, again, it, it's been vetted by counseling and mental health and it, it is used across the country and particularly it is part of the National Registry of Evidence-Based Practices. Um, so it's legit, y'all. Um, and I, I hope you explore. Um, and, and once it goes live, you'll be made aware of it. We are working on the marketing material to roll that out, but you have the first inside tip, so to speak, um, by coming in today and, and knowing that this is coming. And then go to the next slide. And then the next one. So in addition to that, this is not related to you, but I still think really helpful for you to know is we have a lot of services that we are targeting towards students. Um, this is the BHM, which I'm sure actually realize a lot of you are not familiar with. This is the survey that all students who come into counseling and mental health take. Um, and we measure whether the student is experiencing normal to mild distress to severe distress. And of course, this is not 100% accurate as, as any um, self-assessment is. But 
if you look at it, there are so many students who are in the green to that orange area. And I wanna share that because what we're doing is also rolling out specific program to really, programs rather, to catch those students who may be in your courses and they're having a hard time, but they're not open to coming into counseling and mental health services. And we are doing that through our, our new Therapy Plus programming that is also launching in the fall. Let me go to the next slide. Um, in addition to the Therapy Plus, I think I may have put this out of order, so I'll apologize. We do have our MHART response team. I'm not sure who's aware of this, um, but this is something I particularly wanted to share with faculty and staff. Um, they are able to do welfare checks for students who live on campus or live within the DPS radius, right? And, and many times, as I mentioned before, as faculty members, you are a first responder. So you're the first to notice if a student has, hasn't been to class in several weeks, right? And you may be wondering what's the appropriate thing to do. We now have licensed clinicians at CMH that will go knock on someone's door and we work really, really closely with campus support and intervention. Um, and so again, a, another way for you to team and not have to sit with worry about, hey, what may or may not be happening for a student, you can always reach out to Campus Support and Intervention, and you can also reach out to our MHART Mental Health Assistance Response Team. So that is another resource available to you as well. And that is the, the folks that make up that team. And go to the next slide. And so My Mental Health, again, this is an old flyer from last year, but we are relaunching it again, and it's another effort we're making to engage in outreach. So all first year students, first year undergrad and grad students receive a My Mental Health survey where we are assessing for risk. We are trying to see how students are doing. Um, and so based on this survey, depending on how they're scoring, we're actually reaching out to students who may be experiencing some significant mental health distress be long before they decide to come into the clinic. So again, we're realizing the way the campus landscape is changing and how can we get in there? How can we provide support, particularly to our students who are most in need? Um, and also this, this is a way of providing really important but indirect support to our faculty and staff because you are the individuals who are interacting with these students on a daily basis. And the next slide. And this is more, sorry, this is one that I realized it was now out of order going back to Therapy Plus. Um, the platforms that we're launching, we have you at College, which was also NOD. Um, we have Let's Talk, which has been a program that's in place for a few years now, but you can always encourage a student to come schedule a Let's Talk session. These are not considered therapy sessions, but 20 to 30 minute consultation sessions where someone who, let's say, isn't convinced they want to go into counseling and mental health services. If you are at an academic or um, student affairs site that has an embedded counselor at CMH um, and several, several of our academic offices and student offices do, you can encourage a student to go, hey, let's go to Let's Talk and, and that counselor will engage them and help to figure out, you know, how can we best support this student. Um, Oasis Chat is something that launched this spring um, and that is a way for students to have and engage with a mental health responder via text message, right? So again, these are services for people who are really in more like that green area on the BHM that I showed, but ways to start engaging, ways to start challenging stigma, ways to start supporting students as they explore just mental health resources that makes it so it doesn't feel like it falls so heavily on staff and faculty and things you can support students to or encourage students to go towards if they aren't open to coming into counseling mental health. And the next slide, yeah. Um, and this breaks it down even more so that you at college nod, which is an app that specifically targets uh, social anxiety and loneliness, which is one of those major things we've seen such a huge increase in um, after, I hate saying after the pandemic, I don't know if we're quite still a pandemic, but, but since uh, we've had those COVID regulations in place, and then you will therapy services um, is a third party therapy provider. We do have students who aren't comfortable coming into counseling and mental health services. They don't want any formal record on campus for various reasons. And so if they are open to that, you will as another service. So we have tons of ways that we are really trying to expand our support for students um, really in that in between that green to orange area that aren't necessarily comfortable coming in. We want to make sure that they're supported, that your support is faculty and staff, and you can refer them to the right places needed. 
And then the last slide, this is just our pretty slide of Therapy Plus that kind of organizes all the names. And again, um, we plan to do a heavy promotion in the fall because all of these services, Therapy Plus and Cognito, are new. Um, and so I figured I'd take this opportunity to share a little bit about the student resources, but most importantly, really, really encourage the use of Cognito. Um, it is really important and a helpful tool. And another thing that I did want to mention for folks in various uh, academic and student affairs departments, we do have our embedded counselors at Counseling and Mental Health Services that are at several sites um, who are a resource for you as well. If you have a question, if you want it to team and brainstorm regarding a student who's coming up or just more information, uh, make sure to use those folks. And that information can be found on the Counseling and Mental Health website under embedded if you're unsure if your department has one or not. Um, any quick questions? I know I was going through that pretty quickly. Thank you so much, Danielle. There's one in the chat if you want to answer that one about the Cognito service and if that provides faculty and staff with the experience on their own mental health. It is not targeted for their own mental health. It's more how to refer, right? So it's how to have the challenging conversations, but so many of those skills are transferable, right? As faculty and staff, we have challenging relationships at home. We have challenging family members and challenging friends and other dynamics. And so in that way, it provides support across relationship dynamics, but this is not targeted to be a mental health um, support for you as an individual. Right. Great. Thank you for that. Thanks, Danielle. And we're running out of time, so we're going to skip over Cindy's information. Cindy, did you want to take a minute to say anything? We'll send out the slides. Everyone can at least read your slides. Yeah, just review the slides. You're getting great resource information to follow up with. So let's go forward as we have been. <laughs> Consider the, all of these ways that you can help each other and within USC and in our community. Do you wanna say anything about the last resource here for support? Yes. Well, this is us. We are the USC Workwell Center. We are here for all faculty, staff, and physicians. We have as well included all the student health information. Danielle's resources are incredibly helpful as well. So let's consider how we access them. If anybody feels they need to do that today, please let us know. Wonderful. And just sharing this with all of you who are benefits eligible to encourage you to continue to utilize mental health support tools and resources. We also have our partner through Vitality and we'll be awarding you 25 points for attending each of our webinars throughout this five week series. So more information on that, we'll put that in the post email communication. So we have a minute left. So feel free to put any questions you have into the chat for our speakers to answer. We would love for you to fill out our feedback survey and earn a chance to win a $50 gift card for doing so. And then we'll be raffling off uh, in, a, in a few seconds, two raffle winners. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so Carla can pull up her raffle wheel <laughs> and we can select our winners. Thank you all. If you do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat while we have our, our speakers. We're raffling off two work well journals so you can reflect and write gratitude. And Daisy DeLeon, congratulations. My team will be in touch with you to coordinate delivery of your journal. And our last winner for today. Oh, almost the same person, Vanessa Redu. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here today and for being part of our Mental Health Awareness Month series. We'll be back hopefully next year with something similar. So thank you so much. And next program is Walk USC starting next week. So visit our website for more information on Walk USC. And thank you all for spending your lunch with us. Thank you.